Thank you, Chef. Okay. Okay. So now people can see you. Okay, you can start. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, today I'm going to speak about the link between open government data and big data for development and uh, how that relates to inter internet governance and ICT policy. Um, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of really good and interesting presentations today. Um, so, first of all, what is big data? Well, big data, it just moves too fast, it's too big. It doesn't really fit uh, the strictures of traditional da database arch architectures. Um, so we all have to try to find a different way to process it, to analyze it. So it comes from social network centers, satellite imagery, mobile phones, GPS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are we going towards the Internet of Things? But we're not quite there yet. What is open government data? Well, if you're in this room, you you most likely know what it is already, but it's generally any information or data that is produced or commissioned by government or government controlled in entities and can be used and reused and, and redistributed by anyone freely. Um, so open data can be part of big data, but big data is, is most certainly not always open data. So data, the amount of data in the world is growing. We've gone from kilobytes database that's one followed by 27 zeros and it's estimated to grow to 35 database by 2020 with with this storage capacity is also growing um, in large part because of cloud computing and uh, uh, available and, and, and because of cloud computing and increase increases there's there has been an increase in storage The amount of data that is stored across geography, um, here I thought I'd, I'd illustrate how it is being differentiated across regions. So in North America, there's uh, 3,500 petabytes, you have 2,000 petabytes, but in other regions, it's comparatively, especially when you consider the population, much less. This clearly points to who is actually in control of the world's data and who contributes most to the global data pool. Also, the pace at which mobile phones, uh, data generated from mobile phones is, is also increasing and this is unmatched in the history of technology. So far, the, to date, there's about 6 billion mobile phone subscriptions worldwide and 75% of the world now has access to a mobile phone. Well, this is understandable because mobile phone technology provides an app substitute for limited telecommunications and public infrastructure, for example, unreliable transport or lack of adequate financial services. Um, however, internet penetration is still highest in North America, Europe, and Europe, for instance, but lower in Africa, followed by Asia and Latin America. On the other hand, internet traffic is expected to quadruple by 2015. Across the developing world, a mobile full first strategy is being prioritized. So, big data, and I should say data, open data as well, as part of the big data, big data most broadly, is transforming government, industry, development, and policy. In 2011, the business analytics software market was worth over $30 billion. And a lot of the tools that are being used for, for analyzing data is open source and free. For instance, Kaggle enables organizations to source data sorting and analysis to data scientists and software developers by turning them into competitions with big monetary reward. Data intermediaries are also very much increasing in importance. With respect to government, research has shown that investing in the use and analysis of big data could actually reduce 
your your administrative cost to 15 to 20 percent by 15 to 20 percent and also add uh, billions in revenue and also increase productivity but however i would say governments need to revolutionize their e-government services and for developing countries these also include m government programs there's also lots of other initiatives like the open government partnership which is also uh, prioritizing and assistance assisting governments with uh, open data initiatives um, and the opening up government data is also encouraging public sector data reuse. With respect to development, we've been moving from freedom of information to open government data and now big data. There's also been renewed calls for a review of the effectiveness of aid and initiatives like IRT. Uh, has proved quite promising. Other initiatives, particularly regarding with respect to crowdsourcing, like I create a bribe, is being used to address corruption in India. Um, bread, there's also, I thought, very interesting, a uh, bread fruit planting project um, that is aimed at addressing world hunger. It's actually being developed based on a mashup of FAO hunger data with a map showing areas suitable for growing breadfruit. And why breadfruit? Breadfruit is actually a starchy fruit staple, um, similar to potatoes that could actually, uh, and actually, that actually also grows in tropical uh, regions of the world. Then we also have uh, initiatives like Ushahedi, which I know a lot of you probably know about, that uses crowdsource, a crowdsourcing plat platform to address a uh, political crisis to uh, disaster relief and a whole host of things, which was born in Kenya. Um, then there's the UN Global Pulse Lab, uh, which is an initiative uh, that is using, um, that is focusing on using big data to, or what they call data philanthropy, to uh, address or crisis, address needs in times of crisis and better uh, address Millennium Development Goals by doing so. With respect to policy, I say policy is actually still behind on big data, open government data as well, and privacy, privacy issues are heatedly being discussed, as we all know that the more data that's generated, the less likely uh, the more likely it is, the 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 more generate the more data is generated, the, le the less likely it is to, the more likely it is to be able to tell who actually, uh, the more likely it is to violate privacy, I should say. Um, so the more likely it is to identify the the pe the people behind the data. Um, so that's a very big and heated topic that needs to also be addressed, not only by those advocating big data but also those advocating open government data for development. Also important is intellectually, intellectual property, liability, and other legal issues, like who owns a piece of data, what, what rights come attached with a data set, who, what defines fair use of data, and who is actually resp responsible when an inaccurate piece of data leads to negative consequences. I know government is also very much wary of this, not just industry. With respect to and all of these are also, I should mention, internet governance issues. So cyber crime, for instance, incurs losses of $140 billion annually. Um, and who knows when, when this data is being used, uh, what kind of possibilities uh, lie ahead and how it could be used or how, how the data data violations could, could occur which actually have serious negative consequences. Then there's also this, your falsific falsification of data, which I'd say isn't necessarily a big data or open government, government data um, issue, but just a data issue more generally, which actually could become exacerbated um, the more data is made available to others. So discussions are being held and portals are being launched around the world, um, particularly in not, not only in the US or in Europe. 
Um, for instance, I know the Premier Secretary will speak about this. Kenya has launched an open government data website, um, and they're very much active um, in Africa um, on open government data and, and open government data we use. Uganda hopes to launch an uh, open data initiative in 2013. Somalia also hopes to make all data about Somalia held by international de development organizations available. The African Development Bank Group launched an open data for Africa platform, uh, hoping that it will increase access to, quality of, to the quality data needed to manage the MDG goals, the Millennium Development Goals in African countries. Discussions were recently held in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic to promote open government data and open source for sustainable development. And I have others listed here, uh, Open Data for Public Policies Initiative for Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, in Brazil, Open Government Data Portal was recently released as well. So these are really taken off in, in numerous countries, and not just portals, but also initiatives, and uh, exploratory in nature, some of them, but they actually re really must focus in on how not just the, the data, but how it could be, be reused and how it could be linked to many different issues related to sustainable development. So what about you? So marketers, employers, and governments are analyzing our data. The questions are arising about if it would actually ultimate benefit, ultimately benefit big governments and big corporations, but not really you. However, the quantified self-movement, um, uh, followed by, well, for example, Google Health and Microsoft Health or patients like me, are actually providing a, a better, much more effective way for uh, the public to share real-world health experiences, to help others and to help themselves and, and to improve their conditions. And uh, with respect to big data, government is a lot of gov governments are now pri prioritizing the use of big data for health um, as well. Um, then there's also the issue of, however, there's also the issue of predictive analysis. For instance, would the analysis of this data and with the generation of this data or the use of it actually lead to inventing of the future? Also, each individual should have access to ICT and the data and the ability to use it for their benefit. And as we saw earlier, this, this is not necessarily the case at the moment. Also, can you really, can you all really ex ex process all this information, data vis visualization and analysis tools will be needed to be able to do this because as economist Herbert Simon says, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the abundance of information sources that consume it. Also, you should ask, will the use of the analysis of, of such data um, and the options that we are given based on the use of data actually lead us to, to make us privy to fewer and fewer options and opinions. In closing, I just want to uh, share this diagram that I did to just illustrate the link between open data and big data and internet governance ICT policy. I think that it's used like cybersecurity, e-participation, infrastructure and critical internet resources, intellectual property rights, privacy and personal data protections, which are protection, which are all internet governance issues, also very much uh, influence um, the use and the generation of big data or data, open data, open government data and big data for development. Um, at the heart of this, however, is you, is each of us, and uh, this there needs to be a balance, a geographical balance of the world, the, the data that is gener generated across the world. There also needs to be the skill investment in the skills needed to, to do so. Um, and human insight, regardless of how much, how many tools we, we use or how much uh, data we generate, we still need some kind of level of human insight as well. Also, there needs to also, just like the internet governance process has been multi-stakeholder in the ATA, so will be so needs to be the open data and big beast so needs to be the structure 
structure used for the use of open data and big data for development as well. Um, in closing, I just uh, put one, use one example of how with respect to development, I would say, um, data can be used uh, how the, how communities could actually be empowered to use data and actually generate even better data than sometimes even the government could. The Society for the Pro Promotion of Area Resource Centers and Slum Dwellers International, um, they found they've worked with communities to gather data about slums and their land and amenity status, as well as data about households in the old Fadama in Accra, Ghana. They found that when everyone in the community actually participates by answering the same same questions about who they are, what they do in the city, where they live, what their challenges are, etc., it actually produces an identity and solidarity that is needed to send consensus and collective priorities. They found that it also produces much better data than professionals produce. It is much more cost effective and it actually helps solve language issues and cultural barriers, trust issues, lack of map issues. Um, so, and in addition, it also helps aid dialogue with governments and legitimize data that the poor collect about themselves and aids better investment not only by governments but by NGOs and the development sector. So even when, when we release all the data, when we use the data, um, we should also bear in mind uh, the people who the, the generation of the data is supposed to benefit, which is the people where the data comes from, and involve them in the pr process and in public re and, and the use of that data. So that's it. I hope it provided a, a overview, a brief <laughs> overview of everything um, for the rest of the panelists to speak uh, on. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I'll clap on the microphone so you can hear us. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. That was Kisha Taylor. Um, now we'll have uh, Mr. Bitange in demo. From the, we'll keep questions for the for later on. Uh, as I say, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Communication of Kenya. Um, <coughs> thank you. And I think uh, Kisha has co covered many points. I'm only going to emphasize a few and uh, share with you the experience of Kenya with the open data. We launched this about a year ago and uh, became part of the Open Government Partnership also a few months uh, after the launch of uh, the Open Data Kenya. Uh, we launched Open Data simply because we wanted to enable the youth to access government data and come up with a number of applications. And uh, six months into the open data, we have seen more than 50 new applications, especially on the mobile platform, that have come out as a result of that. Now the, <coughs> the problem we face is that most of them need real-time data. And the government has traditionally collected data and uh, taken some number of years working on it before it becomes official. This is the greatest challenge that we face uh, with respect to accessing to real-time data. <coughs> we have uh, started some initiatives where we could have real-time data uh, directly from sources, but uh, this also has a, another challenge of uh, being accepted as authentic because government, when they collect the data, they have to uh, do a number of studies to ensure that it's correct. At the same time, <coughs> we are uh, digitizing a lot of uh, data that has lied there, uh, especially health data. We have started with National Hospital. Uh, we suspect that a lot of answers to problems that we've had in terms of healthcare can be found in the data that it lies and analyzed. And uh, this, this is the target we are hoping that <coughs> in the next few years we should be able to understand 
especially the increase in cancer in the country. We are also looking at how we can gather data on food security, on food safety, um, such that uh, citizens can have it on, at the, in their mobile phone. Most Kenyans use their mobile to access the internet. And uh, some of you have uh, read about Kenya. Uh, we started this with uh, mobile, mobile money. Uh, today, almost 70% of the mobile money is in Kenya. And because of that, we have seen that we can bring in more new applications that would change the country. Some of the new ones that are coming are uh, focusing more in the area of agricultural productivity. Uh, through use of GPS, for example, and available data, uh, we could be able to enable the farmers to know, one, uh, the type of crop they need to grow, the amount of fertilizer that they need. They also could know, for example, um, <coughs> the markets. Some uh, applications are assisting farmers in, with respect to price determination and others. Uh, but more importantly is the issue of big data. What do we know about it and how do we take it forward? Um, just recently we had a conference on uh, big data, especially <coughs> that which we can get from the government. Uh, because traditionally even the academics have looked at the relational data basis and forgetting that even unstructured data can actually be utilized to get into predictive, uh, pre to predict some of the events. Uh, those of you who have closely looked at, for example, uh, the disaster in Indonesia compared with the disaster uh, caused by sand in the US, uh, you begin to see the importance of big data. Um, and uh, there are much more problems in some cultures and uh, to be able to trust that through data you can come up with a prediction of what is going to happen. And so when we talk about big data, we also talk about how we are going to sensitize the citizens to begin to understand that uh, it's, this is going to happen, we must take these actions. Americans understood that the data has indicated Sunday is coming, we must move. That is why they lost 110 lives. In Indonesia, there was unstructured data, for example. The animals moved up the hills, and uh, no animal died, but millions of people, hun hundreds of thousands of people died. And these are the things we must begin uh, to look at and be able to change the culture, to look at the... And the data must be out there for everybody to understand and be able to take actions by themselves. In my country, for example, <coughs> it's much easier for meteorological departments to leave their data so that we can be able to know that we're going to have a drought next year. Uh, if the farmers or those cattle herders would know there's going to be disaster, they could actually begin to sell their livestock before the drought comes and kills all of them. Uh, this is so important that uh, this data must be available out there if people must begin uh, to trust uh, that the data uh, impacts on their lives. And that's why um, in Kenya we have said it would be out there. We will do the analytics and provide it, and government can make policy interventions, but it's also important that citizens themselves can make the decisions uh, because data is available. There are several other areas we are targeting. I said the area of healthcare which is so big and uh, which has so much data and which from our estimation we would cut as much as 40 percent of the health care cost in the country because if we had data available we can improve certain processes for example uh, such that the government can cut cost in terms of health care in agricultural sector there are several areas we are targeting that would improve on the productivity. Even within the government itself, uh, for government to improve productivity, numbers must be there. In education, we have done a number of 
uh, policy intervention emanating from open data. Uh, for example, we've had problems with young girls dropping out of school. Um, we were not able to crack it until we had the census and proved to the Ministry of Finance that if you look at the data, we have dropouts uh, when girls get to 13. And the solution looking deeper was to find that if government provided sanitary towels, you would get many girls going through school. And indeed, uh, the government intervened with the policy to provide that. So you are beginning to see a pattern where there is policy intervention because the numbers were available and were made public. Uh, there are several other areas that we must begin to look, as I said, in terms of uh, food security, for example, um, the quality of water, because a lot of children are dying from water. Uh, this actually can be dealt with uh, through use of ICTs where practically everybody knows whether the water they have is clean or whether the food they have on their table is clean. These are areas that have not been targeted because of the availability of uh, open data and the data being available because at some point we had ISO 9000 which accumulated so much data, but it was not possible to use that data for an ordinary person when you walk into a supermarket, whether you can actually be able to know whether the food you're buying is organic or not organic. Uh, so these are the new areas that we're targeting, which we would know for, which, which for sure is going to be a big industry because uh, you are not just going to buy uh, vegetables uh, without actually knowing the history of those vegetables and how they would impact on your life. Uh, so big data is going to be a big issue going forward and it will touch practically every livelihood uh, as I've stated here, from healthcare, education, agriculture to everything. Uh, this data must be available and uh, it's not going to be like the government doing the analytics and uh, saying government has never been good in terms of data analytics because they normally take an angle that is favorable to itself. But when you give it to the citizens, every citizen has a way of looking at the data and coming with the new innovations. These are the areas that we are looking at. And hopefully uh, we can be able now to take this and use it to neighboring countries. And this is how we can begin to grow <coughs> this data because data um, that the neighbors around where you are and becomes regional data it becomes more important. Of course, there are challenges with respect to people using security as a, a reason of not putting data out there. This morning, we discussed the same, that some governments are saying, well, data is for our competitiveness. Um, this is what I call nonsense, because if you look at the benefits that come from availing data and the cost of uh, fear of security, uh, the, the benefits far outweigh. And uh, once you become regional, because um, even if you take Africa and Europe, we're intertwined because a lot of our, our food exports is to Europe. So it, it becomes a global issue when you are in Europe, for example, shopping and knowing this product emanated from Kenya and these are the conditions, this is a soil type, this is the amount of fertilizer that was used, um, it becomes a global issue. Uh, so for me, uh, development going forward uh, would mean that even the farmers begin to understand their relationships with the markets that they are looking at. And that's how we can have a better world to live in, all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, our next uh, panelist will again be on the via Webex. Will be <coughs> I forget it right. Priyanti Daluwater from Sri Lanka. Priyanti, are you there? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think we can hear you. Yeah, you should be able to should be able to access your uh, Webex presentation. Uh.
Will you upload it or over there? Yeah, the presentation is working. You can go ahead. Right. Um, hello. A very good morning. Good evening to you, all of you, uh, chairperson, and all the other speakers and participants who are already there. I'm sorry, I can't see the um, room right now. And uh, you can't see me either because of poor, poor bandwidth. So my presentation today will be on tours and open government and overview from Sri Lanka and the South Asian region. Uh, I'm just quoting a model for effective data use as referred by Michael Gerstein in his research and publication on empowering the open, empowering the empowered or effective data use by everyone. In that, he highlights important issues. The first one being the internet. Secondly, computers and software, computer software skills, content and formatting, interpretation, sense making, advocacy, and governance. So, when it comes to internet, especially with regard to the developing countries, the connectivity is a major issue because not everybody will have good bandwidth connection and also access. And uh, again, even if the internet is through a telecenter, the people will have difficulty in reaching. And or maybe different times the telecenter is open and then due to community practices, and the girls are unable to go to the telecenter. And also the second point is, is having proper computers. If data is supposed to access in a proper way, high powered computers and software should be available. And also software skills. If one were to, to make decisions depending on data use and reuse, he or she must have proper understanding of Excel or kind of uh, software that is able to produce analytical reports. Then also interpretation and sense making. The person who reads the data should be able to make decisions based on what he gets. And also the community practices on advocacy and governance. So have those in mind, let me show a world map of open data, government data initiatives. On this, you can see the initiatives are mainly concentrated in the US and the European region. So in Asia, there are hardly any red dots. So let me give a brief account on the Sri Lanka situation. Um, Sri Lanka is an island in the Indian Ocean. It's the area is 65,000 square kilometers with a population of 20.8 million. We are a middle level income country, 97th in the Human Development Index. The literacy rate is 92.5, but unfortunately the IT literacy rate is 40%. It ranks 71 on the Network Readiness Index. Um, the land to mobile fo phone uh, is accounts for nine, 21 million, which is uh, 1 million more, almost uh, 0.2 million more than the entire population. The telephones per 100 persons, including cellular phones, is 105.1. So you can see that we are quite ahead in mobile land, land phone connections. Internet penetration as a total of population is 4%. So having that background, let me give a brief account on the East Sri Lanka initiatives that the government has taken up. The major role is played by, by the ICT agency of Sri Lanka, which comes under the presidential office. So the, the main, main activity is they have, uh, on the East Sri Lanka initiative, they have uh, 
set up a connection of uh, rural tele centers, 687 tele centers, which we call Nanasala in Sinhalese, right across the country. It provides affordable telecom services to the rural communities, e citizen services, e learning, and IT literacy, to mention an important few. Then we also have the Sri Lanka government network, the information infrastructure backbone that connects all the government organizations. Initiatives are taken to make the government content made available in all three languages. We have two local languages and English. So it's, a, it's, it's important that all the government websites go on the same format with, with three, three languages. So right now what we see, the main content is in English. So the translation are being uploaded accordingly. We also have the Sri Lanka gate, the Lanka interoperability exchange, the Sri Lanka government cloud, which has been developed to facilitate the open government and open data implementation. The Lanka gate initiatives for e-services. It's, it's an online payment service, mobile payment service, and SMS service. The open government and open data are featuring in a significant manner in the e-government policy of the country. In order to support all these, we have the human resource capacity building program. It will build capacity of government employees and also have pro programs for uh, village level workers of the government sector, provincial councils and the divisional secretariats. The, the telecenters, which I mentioned earlier, provide ICT courses for the rural youth. And we also have MBA in e-governance program, which, which will help the government ICT officers to improve their knowledge in IT. We have to support the functionality of the e-Sri Lanka program, the formulation and adoption of the national ICT policy, and the ICT action plan, and the necessary legal framework. The departmental website for the government will have the contact details of the officers, project specification information. Sorry. Uh, with regard to the Indian situation, the Rights for Information Act has been enacted in India, and they also have the open data platform. The departmental websites in India will have a common portal and connects to all the government ministries. The national data sharing and accessibility policy has been recently notified by the government through a gazette notification. So I'm just showing the clip of the data.gov in uh, India. The, the, the URL is given at the bottom. And only India has the data.gov.in website right now. Sri Lanka is in the process of progressing towards it. And other South Asian countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Afghanistan, Maldives, and Bhutan, what I have noticed in the web-based literary review is that they have all the government information in a, po in a pooled common website, like a portal but they don't have any open government data platforms yet. If we take the South Asian, Southeast Asian region, Singapore has an open government data platform, and also Indonesia. So let me come back to for some factors for consideration. When it comes to developing countries, we have to be careful of the privacy of data. And also we notice that the government departments, they have a reluctance to share data at departmental levels. And also the staff will have fear for technology. And also issues related to infrastructure, poor record keeping practices, and also the inconsistent data available. And mainly we notice that the, in the data that is collected is in English medium. So if we are to have the local language based open government platform, the, the data will have to be converted to the national languages. And also unlike the US and UK, we still do not see a sophisticated, the, the demand for sophisticated analysis 
then stock data. So what is use, reuse, and redistribution is a query when it comes to developing countries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pijati. Mm -hmm. Now, without delay, I will give the word to. Ooh. I will give the word to Bevel. Thank you. Uh, I want to um, to use the time to quickly build on what has been said by the other presenters uh, and describe a bit of the experience of with open data in the Caribbean, but also more generally with what we are doing um, even further afield. I am head of a, a non-profit organization, Bright Path Foundation, which ties technology and, um, and education and also has a lot of interface and outreach with governments. And what we've heard in terms of the, the open data movement so far uh, really speaks to what I call the open, um, the open data ecosystem. And um, just to give you a quick sense of what that ecosystem has to have for open data to be realized, uh, we heard about the tools and the platforms, the, the, the content, obviously, data has to be put out there. Um, applications have to be built, as, as we're seeing and heard from the Kenyan example. Government has a, a key part to play because, one, they're the holders of the largest repositories of data in most cases in most countries. But policy is also a big um, part of the equation, um, policy that facilitates the opening up of um, closed data sets and making those accessible to um, the wider society for use and reuse. But there are three other, other points inside of the ecosystem that I want to highlight. One is the issue of leadership, and, and Kenya is again a good example of um, enlightened leadership making the way for uh, or paving the way for uh, open data innovation to take place. And the other is access, access tied with infrastructure, and, and that's key. Um, it's all well and good to, to put stuff out in open formats, but if an, an emphasis is not placed on how do people access it, um, then the, the work or the effort is in vain. And really and truly for all of these things to, to work um, in tandem, you also need the, the people factor. Um, and and I, I, I like to start in this way discussing it from an, and what's the open data ecosystem standpoint because it's important to understand that all of these elements, people, applications, government, policy, content, tools and platforms, awareness, access and infrastructure and leadership must um, be coordinated first to realize the, the goals. In the Caribbean region, the same um, the same types of benefits are often touted about open data. It improves transparency, it can be used to harness new levels of innovation, um, and it can also, of course, create entirely new and significant um, economic opportunities uh, inside of the, the different countries. Uh, but the reality that we've seen and, and that continues to be a barrier to, to open data adoption um, include things like the fact that transparency is not actually always desired. Um, and while, there, while uh, the benefits of open data should be obvious, sometimes the, the benefits of closed data uh, also need to be borne into consideration when, um, when trying to develop ways of overcoming resistance and obstacles. Uh, one of the things that is causing or resisting the, the, the sometimes reflexive uh, disposition to keep data closed is the increasing give it to me now culture that, that the internet is phoning. Uh, people actually want and expect access to, um, to information as quickly and as easily as possible. And that's, that's proving to be a very significant incentive uh, for getting open data initiatives moving at the political front. Um, happy citizens make, happy voters make, um, happy governments. And that these are very practical. I'm giving you some practical um, uh, discoveries that we have found in, in promoting open data in the Caribbean. So the give it to me now culture is resulting in increasing intolerance to any barriers to access. In Trinidad and Tobago, for example, uh, there is a Freedom of Information Act, a wonderful initiative in its time, but it requires citizens to make an appeal to government for information. And what Open Data is doing, of course, is saying, look, I'm going to give you information before you ask for it, and it's always there for you when you need it. And so people, once they get a sense of these possibilities, start to demand it in all other kinds of areas. Um, Another challenge that we have is the fact that there are few success stories at the local and regional level as it relates to, to open data. Um, but one thing is clear, there is a connection between open government data and spurring new levels of innovation within countries. Um, 
and this is tied to the, and the equation is simple, the rise in the internet and the rise in access to the internet is leading to a rise in requests for open data and um, increased appetite for open data initiatives. So uh, there are some barriers to innovation adoption, uh, to open data adoption that I, I wanted to highlight. Um, and I'm highlighting these not as, as obstacles that prevent us from moving to open data, but as things particularly for countries where uh, there is an interest in and an inclination to moving toward open data, the things that have to, um, to be dealt with um, to get these, these programs moving inside of government and even in terms of wider support. One, lack of familiarity with the open data model. Uh, we are seeing uh, over time an increasing number of references and, and research work on does open data actually result in tangible economic benefit. Um, but for a lot of people, the unfamiliarity with what open data means um, can present a barrier. Second, the lack of, of evidence, which goes together with the absence of um, broad research on open data. And the more reports come out and the more examples we see from other countries, particularly other emerging markets, uh, the easier it is to sell open data. Um, perceived challenges to ownership, control, and monetization also present um, real barriers. Uncertainty on how to leverage and not yet a critical mass of interested developers. Open data needs developers willing to write um, applications that take advantage of access to information. Um, but these problems all have solutions. And we're seeing that as, as, um, as models emerge in the developing and developed world, uh, people are cottoning on to the fact that open data matters. Uh, in the region this year, uh, we had the first Caribbean open data initiative. Um, and that actually went, um, was conducted in several countries simultaneously and the results are uh, collated. And it represented the first time at a regional level. Remember the Caribbean is made up of several sovereign states, uh, over uh, 25 countries and 35 million people. Uh, so this was a, a, a pretty remarkable achievement to have a region-wide open data initiative. Um, and we're also seeing the, an increase in uh, software development, code jams or, um, or hackathons, where people are, are getting an appetite for developing software based on the available uh, data. This is doing something very interesting in the environment. One, it's highlighting the importance of collaboration. Developers can't by themselves cause governments to open data. Governments by themselves can't force or, or encourage developers to start writing once they open their data. And so a new dialogue is, is opening up. And it's, it's one that is driven by uh, actual leaders in the different aspects of the ecosystem, as I described it. Um, in terms of uh, what we're looking at to make it all happen uh, and how we're proceeding, one, exciting innovators and entrepreneurs with the idea of open data creating a sense of enthusiasm for uh, what open data possibilities can exist and linking that with real government initiatives um, that are attempting to provide greater access to citizens for government services. Uh, second, start with what we have. Uh, it's important in open data to realize while there are wonderful uh, examples out there, you don't get there overnight. And so it's, it's, um, it's important to start on the basis of what is possible and use that as a platform for ramping up. Uh, thirdly, engage in media. Uh, we found that it's very important to create public awareness by reaching new audiences. Sometimes these conversations take place amongst uh, people who are very familiar with the ins and outs of open data technology, uh, software development, um, but the applications are intended to reach the people. And so uh, engaging the media is one aspect that has been used and is being used to create this sense of of enthusiasm at a level wider than simply government and software developers. Um, create opportunities. Uh, this, is, this is where the whole issue of leadership comes in. Uh, having a friendly force in government um, is a big, big, huge factor in opening up the, the, the doors to the data, but also in accelerating the wheels of the bureaucracy and celebrate successes openly. Um, one of the things that we use the Caribbean Open Data Initiative to, um, to highlight was that, hey, there are people out there willing and able to use the data. Here they are, let's applaud them for what they're doing and let's give them the tools and the uh, mechanism that they need to do what they do best, which is to innovate. Uh, with those few remarks, I hand you back to the moderator. Thanks, Havil.
Okay, so I think we'll try to we'll open the questions to the floor. So we have a microphone, and also we'll open to the remote panel. So do we have any questions online? Not yet. So um, do we have the microphone? We got some questions here already. Could you? You can see we are all tired. <laughs> From here you can see very well. <laughs> um, my, name Al. my name is Al from Kenya, and I mm -hmm. have a question for the three uh, panelists, um, including those uh, online. And my question is, um, we all agree that data has to be open. But there, there is debate right now as to whether uh, open means uh, Creative Commons license or open means uh, truly open. Uh, so I just wanted to find out, you know, from all of you, what does open mean? What does uh, and and when you decide uh, that you're going to license the data, um, are you licensing it uh, freely or are you licensing it with uh, with caveats? In Kenya, we are going, we are trying to use more and more the Creative Commons, uh, but um, we've also said that anyone can use uh, the government data as long as they they acknowledge that uh, this is the source that we have used it from. Um, because government data, we have already paid taxes, and uh, it it's out there. The more people do the analytics about it, the more we understand about our data. In terms of how we, we currently advise governments in the Caribbean, we basically also promote the Creative Commons license. And on the basis that uh, it is uh, government data, but it is the public's data held in government trust. So uh, any effort to open it should be truly open. Um, but the issue of source is, is important and acknowledging the source and so the, the Creative Commons license is a really good way of, of doing that and that's the model that we promote. Yeah, just to complement, um, in a European context, there, are, uh, there is a European uh, database directive which means that you can't, I mean there are several layers of uh, intellectual property on a database, on the content of each item, on the structure of the database, on the actual file. And there are, I mean, there are quite a few, I mean, it's quite complicated to see what would be the single license, for example, uh, for a database of photographs, you know, that would add, like, lots of lawyers, you know. So, not normally what we would advocate uh, would be to follow the open definition from the Open Knowledge Foundation, which some, you know, in some cases, uh, there are some Creative uh, Commons licenses, not for databases at the moment, that would comply. But ultimately, the fundamental thing for open data is that to have something where there is no discrimination in principle, and that allows interoperability and the maximum redistribution. You know, but again, licensing itself, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, the problem is if you don't put any license, the default is that it's copyrighted and you shouldn't use it. So you have to actually legally tell people that they are allowed to use it somehow. So that's the thing. And I think attribution in the case of government data is more important in many ways uh, than in the descent than for individual creators, because you are looking at um, quite serious issues. I mean, we're looking at um, data about uh, droughts, you know, fa famine, you know, is this water safe to it? I mean, you really need to be able to trust the provenance of data in those cases. So I think that having some really hard methods for proof provenance, you know, and traceability will be very important. Hello, uh, my name is Amelia Anderschachter. I'm a member of the European Parliament, um, and so I'm all too familiar with the complications that the uh, head of this panel just addressed. But I, I wanted to ask the people who, on the panel who aren't from European countries if you also think about uh, how you structure kind of uh, s form formats for the data or uh, standards for the software that in interpret the data if you develop this like in-house or when you organize your uh, Caribbean hackathon, for instance, are you also ensuring that there's uh, some definition of openness in, in that 
infrastructural layer for dealing with the uh, data, or uh, is it only on the like Creative Commons actual intellectual property rights licenses on the data that you've been discussing so far? Yes, Otto. Uh, in the case of the Caribbean, because it's still pretty early days, uh, there is no standard in terms of uh, the format for the data or the, the software development models, but. Uh, that's what we're hoping uh, as we identify those who are interested in the space. That's exactly what we're going for, is that there will, at the end of the day, be common formats across the entire region for how data is presented and how use is made of it. So that's being advocated, but there is nothing um, tangible in place right now. We have begun to look at the standards, and the, that is where my greatest fear comes in, because um, most of the innovations come where there is no proper legal framework. And, um, and and if you begin to think about uh, the legal framework, then you completely destroy innovation. And uh, although we want to create standards, especially in linked data, which would help government more in other areas, I don't think um, we would go into restrictive standards um, as we create this, especially from the legal side. Um, and I am more of that, uh, let us go along with these innovations, because if you look the word Kenya and innovation, it's been a very long time before they were in the same sentence until we began doing these things of uh, internet and uh, big data. Um, we have come up with a number of new innovations and the more we leave people, the better um, for some time. Just, for, um, just very quick, in terms of technical standards, yes. are you working, I mean, legal standards are one thing and then technical, uh, technical standards? standards, yes. The especially building uh, linked data, for example, they must be in certain formats so that you are not, you are able to link. Um, we don't just say that you pr provide the data there. Yes, sir, I have a question. But what about um, the information about the data itself, like, uh, by example, uh, qualifying the data about uh, the quality of the data itself. Not all the data we have published is has the same quality, and so when we are to go some analysis, it's, uh, it's important to take care of the quality of the data. Is there any protocol or, or metadata that is associated with this, yeah, standard metadata for this uh, kind of information? Actually, I made reference to it that uh, the greatest challenge is going to come from real-time data. Uh, usually, the government the government data you get has gone through curate, curation and whatever, and actually it's, it's real data that is can be trusted. But as we get more and more pressure into real-time data, and which we could collect actually, uh, that's where the problems would begin whether you can trust the data or not. But w the mechanism that we want to put in place that uh, after maybe on a weekly or monthly basis, uh, one can do a survey on, on sa some of the real-time data that is required by these apps developers. Uh, nobody knows how it's going to play out. But as for the data now that is available on our open data. It is data that has gone through all the processes where they have uh, done all kinds of tests to make sure that it's authentic data. And just to add, uh, I think that there are two, at least two questions around the quality of data. One is the quality of the measurements or the input. So if you are using a bad thermometer, you are going to get bad temperature data. The other is about whether, uh, for example, if you look at the UK budget, every department structures their reporting in completely different ways. There is no information about what those figures may mean, 
and many people would say that that is bad quality data because it's not useful. Now, no one would probably question the accuracy of the uh, figures. So I think that there are two issues there. No? For the second question of having data that is useful, and there are uh, the answer to that for many people is being, <laughs> maybe Bitangi would not agree, but it's actually to develop more standards for reporting and trying to homogenize the way that government departments and aid organizations and many, you know, many groups try to produce data, so it's actually useful. There are some people try to define what kind of added information you need to need to bring in and things. Now, the other problem of the original quality of the data that is, st I mean, still very real, no? Like the, um, and, and there is no short-term solution, at least from the open data movement, for that. Yeah. Other, I mean, the other thing about trust, something to say. I mean, there are different models around uh, building trust for data and quality. In a way, I mean, you can spot quality, for example, by seeing how many people link to a data set. So if lots of people use a data set as a source for applications, I mean, normally that means that it's going to be more trustworthy than one that doesn't have anyone else linking. So that would be another way of more or less having quality control. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, I think, uh, well, one of the questions that I was going to ask actually has been uh, asked. My name is George uh, Nebuga from uh, uh, Kenya, and I work for Afrinic in Mauritius. And uh, this was related to the uh, quality of uh, the data that we have on um, open data platforms, for example, and whether uh, it is uh, raw data that we want, uh, one that hasn't been analyzed and one that um, many people may privilege. Uh, but uh, sometimes I worry about uh, the quality of data, particularly in um, sensitive situations uh, where such data may, you know, cause obviously um, issues of moral panic or such uh, related issues. But I, I think you've addressed that, that to some extent. Uh, the other issue that I wanted to raise is uh, what I may call information glut. Uh, having so much information that people may need uh, to be uh, more critical to make sense of that uh, uh, data itself. And particularly in uh, an internet illiterate community, I if, if you may, uh, one that is not hugely sensitized about uh, uh, the quality of um, you know, data that is available online and how to make uh, use of, uh, and sometimes to disaggregate, uh, if you may, uh, quality data from uh, trivial. I think there's a lot of trivial, of course, on, on the internet and such. Uh, uh, issues, I think, uh, that should be uh, looked at more uh, critically. So how do you make uh, the community that uh, is not uh, perhaps educated about uh, data that is available online to ensure that they make use of critical data, useful data, rather than uh, sometimes the trivia that may uh, come out as raw uh, data rather than one that is refined uh, using, um, uh, you know, well-established mechanisms? Thanks. We debated this much earlier um, as we introduced, uh, launched the Open Data Kenya, and uh, the first uh, people we began sensitizing were the media itself, because um, media in developing countries normally give you a picture, it lacks an <coughs> analysis uh, that leads to the event. For example, accidents, uh, motor vehicle accidents. They would show you a picture, a bus rolled and the 10 people died. That is the picture of it. But they don't go back uh, to tell you that uh, the same spot we have had 20 accidents and uh, the design of the road was not correct. I mean, this, this is all data that is available, but it's not been analyzed so that it's communicated and the people begin to understand that what you need to correct is the road. Um, and then number two, which I indirectly referred to, is the culture. The culture. In some cultures, they would actually find out, they would ask, media would ask the right questions. Why, as it has been that 20 different drivers have rolled on this part of the road, and then they get to the solution. So we must build both the culture, and the media must get to analyze information in much depth. Uh, then the other thing we are doing is that if you look at the Kenya's uh, open data, we have tried as much as possible to disaggregate national data to county data. This is more uh, something that 
uh, people are more interested to know how their account is doing with respect to other counties. Now people have got mo much more interest in that than having interest in the national data. But then we need to work what I normally call a quad, quad helix, where both the researchers, the government, uh, the private sector, and, the, and civil society must all work together because it doesn't have to be that the, the consumer of the information becomes the citizen. It can be civil society who have an impact on the citizens and be able to apply it, or government begin to understand the issues more, like the road experience, and be able to change. So there are several levels of consumption of information. And I gave an example of young girls dropping out of school and the impact their own policy. And that was because data was analyzed and the, the government was able to see the clear picture. So there are several levels from civil society to private sector to government to research institutions to begin to understand uh, this data. Of course, it's going to be too much. Um, our simple test with, with mobile company data, um, you're better off use it to explain inflation than use the usual basket. Uh, you actually get almost precise number of information if you take uh, uh, the mobile phone data and mash it up with other data that you have in government, you are actually almost to the precise points of inflation. But you cannot get it because we consider that as private data. So going forward, uh, we must begin to talk about this data in very different ways. Uh, can we get it for the purpose, not for the purpose of competitiveness, but for the purpose of our common cause, a common problem that we need to, to sort out. So there is public data which is actually not public because they have gathered this from the public, but it's not available to the public. And some of data that is gathered in very many places are actually explanatory variables of sev several issues. If you look at what UN has gathered uh, to deal with emergency, it is, not, it is not quite public, some of it is private, but it is an essential element to mashing up to understand a major problem that needs to be sorted out. So we still have a lot of challenges with these data issues. Just to clarify, when you say there is private data, you mean there is individual data from individuals or data from companies, from mobile phone companies, and that's why you cannot the, get it? The mobile phone companies get it from the public, but it becomes a private property when from the company. Uh, from the company. So side. it's not about data protection it's of users, it's yes, more the company. More okay. the company. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you want to touch and then here? Can you hear me? Okay. I have two questions, uh, unfortunately, still to uh, the permanent secretary. Uh, we know that the government is, uh, is potentially or is usually a provider of uh, big data. So, uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, some thought has gone into uh, explaining some of the concern that some government may have of not making those big data available. And the second question is uh, for the panel in general. Uh, we know that big data usually uh, they should have a kind of legal framework uh, behind it to just to accompany the process because we want to make sure that some uh, potentially uh, some private information, some information that may uh, kind of uh, have some implication in, uh, in privacy are not uh, out there. So I want to know if some work has been done in Kenya, for example, to uh, put in place all these legal framework before big data uh, uh, distributed. Thank you. I think, um, I think we, we forget very quick. Huh? You can hear me? Maybe, maybe, maybe mine, oh, mine is, uh, okay, direct line of sight. 
I think we forget um, the history of the motor vehicle. Um, when Ford came up with the innovation of, uh, in, of uh, brakes, the first time they were doing it with the handbrake, you put the brake and everybody jumps uh, forward. If there was a legal framework that the, the kind of vehicle you make does not hurt anybody, I don't think we could be where we are. Um, I don't know whether anybody has read that history. But don't put the legal framework ahead of innovation. <laughs> Let the innovations come. The damage is not much. Uh, allow people to use data, move forward. You would begin to understand which areas, including the mobile, uh, mobile phone. Initially, uh, several governments did not want to have mobile phone because they said we are going to have propaganda people uh, calling one another and stuff. Internet was closed in many countries up to now uh, through legal frameworks. So um, I don't see the damage that will be there uh, if the legal framework follows innovation. And, and this is why I say if you begin with the legal framework, you fail. And uh, the concerns we have from the government side is uh, if, say for example, the health data we are gathering, we will make sure that uh, the personal data with respect to your name and what is there is not availed to those who are doing the analytics. Um, that, is, that is one thing I think we must be very careful that it doesn't get out there uh, with uh, personal data. But data itself, it's very key uh, to solving some of the problems that we have. And, and it can be availed uh, with um, XXH, whatever and whatever, and you are able to, to use the data. I mean, I, in that um, aspect, you know, obviously as a digital rights organization, we would disagree in <laughs> to a point with, uh, with Bitange, you know, in the in the need for some form of data protection framework. I mean, but, I mean, of course, you cannot, we agree that you cannot legislate innovation to happen and that, you know, and things like, you know, forcing, you know, in that sense, you know, would be totally pointless. What we think is that uh, there are, there is a danger that if you don't think about particularly personal data, there is, a, it's very easy to generate a backlash amongst the population, you know, uh, when they start feeling that actually they are not the beneficiaries. I mean, there is this uh, thing about the internet, no? Anything that you get for free, you are not the consumer, you are the product. And with government data, I mean, you are definitely the citizen. And at the moment that citizens start feeling as products, and that their data is being somehow ends up in, you know, private, in private companies, personal, you know, aggregators of personal profiles, as it actually happens in the US. There are quite a few companies, you know, where if I'm going to employ you tomorrow, I'll buy your whole personal history every court case, everything, your school records, you know, I can find out everything about you. I mean, if people actually knew what, you know, you can find out about them, you know, there would be even more of a backlash. If we start mixing up this sort of thing with open data and all of, all of a sudden the big hype about open data starts being connected with those practices that have been going on much longer than personal data, I think we will, we will have a backlash against it. I mean, there is, in the UK there are things now about medical day, records being shared with, medi uh, with uh, medical companies, anonymized, but the other question I was going to say is that we basically lots and lots of uh, computer scientists nowadays, you know, would argue that you cannot trust anonymization 100% in the long term, you have to be very careful. So, I mean, we are not saying that you shouldn't do it ever, you know, what this is that you have to really be careful how you do these things because the biggest danger is that you are going to turn the population against the whole idea of opening data and using technologies to improve people's lives. So I think that you do need a certain level of data protection framework. And also the sooner that you do it, you know, the better, you know, because you are starting more or less from a blank slate. So you are not trapped by practices. So, yeah. We actually have a, a data protection, a data protection bill that is going through. Um, but uh, the, we must begin to anonymize information for our future. Because if you keep um, take for example which is uh, cancer which is creating havoc all over the world we actually need to understand it who who gets cancer when do they get it how they get it what is their characteristics 
uh, we need to know this. I mean, it's, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, that's the, just to be clear, you are balanced, when, when many people say in this area, oh, we need to see how do we balance innovation with personal uh, information. And the truth is that if you consider uh, privacy a uh, basic right, you are balancing uh, the public interest. I mean, you're not balancing innovation, you're balancing, is this in the public interest for the country and the population, for example, in looking at cancer rates? In the UK, to give you an example, cancer data from patients is actually the only uh, data that's got its own legal framework for data protection, and it's actually shared you know, with researchers with much less protection than anything else, because there has been a public interest case, many people would argue for or against, but there are some clear discussions that that is not just for innovation purposes, to benefit a private company is the public interest. And there, for example, in the case of anonymization, what we would say that serves the public interest is using transparent uh, technologies and algorithms so computer scientists you know can apply open peer review to the anonymization technologies that are being used on data sets so that will generate the trust required you know and avoid any possible problems where you get cases like the AOL you know consumer data or Netflix you know that we've seen in the US where basically individuals have been re-identified you know from supposedly anonymized data sets so for us, you know, transparency on anonymization is fundamental for building up trust with citizens. Sorry. My name is Ali Hussein. Uh, I come from Kenya, Arab. Um, I just want to make a comment on this issue of open data, big, big data, privacy, regulation, and uh, public interest. Um, I think if we take um, some examples, for, for example, in the US, on the issue of uh, medical records, like uh, Dr. Ndemo has talked about, they, I mean, there are areas where we can, uh, we can actually learn about. The health, Im health Information Privacy and Portability Act, HIPAA, in the US. That's talk that actually does a lot of anonymization, and uh, it's eventually not only for the public good, but for the good of the patient himself. It's not open data, but uh, you know, it in actual fact, what you find is that m certain private private uh, you know practices can actually be replicated um, um, from for actual public good. Um, then when we talk when we talk about privacy, for example, you know, um, back in Kenya, a few years ago, we could have asked a question like who is who is on Facebook, for example. But today, the question is who is not on Facebook. Now, if you look at Facebook, you are actually giving private information openly and you know it uh, and they're using it and you've talked about the issue about when you are f w when you're actually um, using something for free you you ask yourself whether you are the user or the product so you find that Facebook is using the same uh, uh, metrics for revenue like a telco so Facebook looks at apples, for example, average revenue per user, and they track it. So we, you know, uh, then the issue of regulation from from an from a Kenyan perspective, if we take the um, the example of M-Pesa, there are certain cases where the private good and uh, energizing of the population is more important than waiting for regulation. It, uh, I think Dr. Ndemo will tell you that it took many years before M-Pesa was regulated by the central bank. Now, if government, if we did not have a forward-thinking government uh, from the central bank functionaries to to Dr. Demo, we would not have the kind of success that we are talking about here. So, I think my point is that we need to be prog we need to be pragmatic in in a number of issues where there are actual cases that there are infringements. Then we need to 
you know. So in most cases, regulation kind of lags behind. Uh, to just take Dr. Ndemo's example of Ford, uh, the, uh, the most famous uh, statement of Henry Ford was, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. That was the initial innovation of different colors for vehicles. Now, today, you go onto the internet and you actually customize your own car. We started somewhere. So did we had another microphone at the back. Was anyone waiting to speak? Hi. Excuse me. Jim, can you ask the guy behind you if he wants to use the microphone? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's... Um, are we in time? Mm -hmm. Okay, we are just in time, you know, so just to, um, to let you know, if you are interested in open data uh, we are going to have another workshop uh, tomorrow at nine. Tomorrow at nine o'clock in room either two or three, <laughs> we will have uh, another workshop looking at open data, not from a developing uh, country perspective, but just looking in general. Quite similar issues that we have been discussing, you know, um, with other. I mean, some also some people from Kenya will be presenting, and uh, that workshop will be on a round table room. So we hope that this time. The presentations will definitely be, you know, we will have a lot more of a discussion there. Okay, so we'll invite you everyone to come. Thank you very much. And uh, we will put a report, I think, in two weeks. You should be able to get a report on this workshop and the other one from the website of the IGF somewhere. Thank you.